hip-hop bands that come out of Germany in the 1990s, by far my favorite. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you all would do something with me, which is say what's on the, on the screen. Yeah, can we do that? But, but, hold on. You got to say it like the woman in the, in the video. <laughs> you with me? Okay, high-pitched. We're going to do it together. Don't make me do this alone. All right? On the count of three. One, two, three. I got the power! All right, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. All right, just turn to your neighbor and look at them. Let's do it one more time. Just say, hey, one, two, three. I've got the power. Yeah, yeah, you do. You have got the power. And I want to tell you about your power. The first place that you got power is with your words. You see, with your words, you can either break people down or you can build them up. You ever have a word spoken into your life that has built you up? Have you ever had a word spoken in your life that has broken you down? Your words have power. Consider this from the Apostle Paul. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. The Apostle Paul is speaking to a group of Christians just like us, and he's instructing them, hey, make sure you're encouraging one another. And the primary way that we encourage one another is with what? Our words. And your words can either build people up or they can break people down. Now, there's power in what you say, but there's also power in how you say it. There's a difference between saying like, I'm bad versus I'm bad, right? There's a big difference in tone. And so there's power in your tone. Your words got power. You can build people up with your words. You can break people down with your words. But your tone can also build people up or break people down. You've got power. Consider this from the Proverbs. A gentle answer turns away anger. You know that's true. You've been in conflict with somebody, and then they've been gentle towards you, and that helped bring down the anger. But mean words, they stir up anger. And a mean tone, it stirs up anger. You can build people up with your words and with your tone, or you can break them down. You have power. You also got power with your look not just how you're dressed, although there's power in how you're dressed. There's a big difference between like this and like this, right? right? Your, your body and your presence, all that has power. Even your facial expressions have power. There's this thing on the internet that's called RBF, resting B face. Anybody know what the B stands for? Call it out. No, I'm just kidding. Don't call it out. Okay. Here, I, I'll say it for you. It stands for resting birch face. Y'all know about this? If you haven't heard about Resting Birch Face, there's a few celebrities that are associated with it. Kristen Stewart, I Googled it, okay, and this is what came up, okay? Kanye, um, Anna, is Anna Kendrick, yep, yeah, yeah. And it's this, like, natural just, like, when they're at rest, they have this demeanor, and people think that they're upset or angry. I had a case of Resting Birch Face. I think I, I, think I had it this morning because I was like trying to get things done, but the story I want to tell you about my resting birch face was back when I waited tables at a restaurant uh, on the north side of Chicago. It was a busy place. It was a wonderful place. I made great money during grad school there, but I had to focus. Otherwise, I would quickly get in the weeds. Anybody know what it means to get in the weeds? Any waiters, former waiters? Yeah, right? You're overwhelmed, and you're behind, and it's horrible, and so I get super focused, and we had this manager named Fernando, and, and he was great at the door. Everybody loved him because he was always smiling and greeting people. And Fernando would see me with my RBF going on, and he would say to me, Scott, smile, smile. And constantly, over and over again, tell me to smile. 
Sometime later, I had a coffee shop that I was leading on behalf of a seminary that I studied at. And I had this one employee. She was great. She was like really good at the job, but she would often bring all of her stuff from home to work, and she would have RBF, and even worse, she would tell all of our guests about what was going on, all of her problems. And I had to pull her aside. Terry, hey, you know, you just can't do that here at the coffee shop. You're just putting out this bad vibe. And she said, well, Scott, I'm just keeping it real. I'm just being who I am. And I said, you know what, Terry? Do you understand that, like, when you smile, it puts people at ease? But when you're constantly frowning, it has a different effect? She's like, yeah, I understand that. Do you understand that, like, you could choose to smile and that would make a big difference? Yeah, I understand that. I want you to be true to that part of yourself that gets that how you show up has an impact on people. You understand that you have power and that you can make a decision on how you look, how you stand, what you say, because your words, your tone, how you look, all this has power. Consider this. A glad heart makes a cheerful face. The writer of Proverbs is saying that actually if, if you constantly have a frown on your face, there's something going on with your heart. If you were to Google resting birch face, okay, you would find that there's scientific study about this, and they say that the, the one emotion that people that tend to have that look on their face have more than everybody else is the emotion or the feeling of contempt. Contempt. You know what contempt is? It's when you think that you're, like, above it. When you think that you're better than others or, or people are, are, are messing up, and, and they, they have found somehow they isolated and the Proverbs, thousands of years before that scientific research, is saying, like, look, hey, a glad heart makes a cheerful face. The condition of your heart will determine what you're carrying on your face. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is crushed. Not by sorrow, but sorrow of the heart. If you were here last week, we talked about the importance of grieving, lamenting, mourning, and that it is those who mourn that are comforted. But those that don't do that, they internalize it all and never deal with their sorrow. They get a sorrowful heart, and it shows on their face. There's also power in your touch. And let's be honest. You could have a harmful touch. Some of our most powerful people in our country <laughs> have been accused of having a harmful touch. But you're also going to have a healing touch. And counselors, they often know quite well that there's appropriate ways to touch somebody when they're engaging in counseling because that touch has power. And if you've got a little one, and I do, if you've got a little one, you know that like the little one, their touch can just be magical. Our touch has power. There's a story uh, about Jesus. He's pretty popular by this point in time. There's this huge crowd around him, and this woman who's been sick for like 13 years, and she's tried it all. You know, she's gone to traditional medicine. She's gone to holistic medicine, seen the chiropractor, done the Cato diet, done it all, and nothing's working. So she hears about this Jesus guy, and she's like, hey, let's give it a try. So she works her way through the crowd, and she just touches the end of his coat. And Jesus... He stops, and he says to his disciples, he goes, somebody touched me. Who was it? And they're like, how could we know? There's like this huge crowd around you, like not somebody touched you. A bunch of people have been touching you. But Jesus, he is fixated on this because he says, look, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. There's power in our touch. That's why the greeting each other here is so wonderful. Because people are handshaking and high-fiving and hugging. And i got to be like, hey, y'all, for the third time, please sit down. There's power in our words, our tone, our look, our touch. You have got power. We're in the fourth week of the kingdom of God. And this is what the Apostle Paul says about the kingdom of God. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It is of what? Say it with me. Power. There's power in the kingdom of God. And there's power in this world. And there's a kind of power in this world that creates havoc in the lives of people. But there's this power that has come along called the kingdom of God. And it's a different kind of power. And it leads to different things. And you can be part of this power. You can leverage your power to be part of this kind of power. If you're brand new to the Bible, you should know the Bible is divided up in these two main sections, the Old Testament, 
which tells the story of the ancient Israelites and the old covenant. You got Adam and Eve and you got Moses and Noah and Jonah, all that good stuff. But then we get to the New Testament. It's 27 books, but not really books. Think of it as ancient documents. A lot of them are letters. But the first four are absolutely remarkable. They're called the Gospels. These are specific takes on the life of Jesus written by four different authors. We've been tracing through the Gospel of Matthew, and it's in the Gospel of Matthew that we've encountered, first and foremost, this theme of the kingdom of God, or as Matthew calls it, the kingdom of heaven. And when given the opportunity to summarize Jesus' preaching in one sentence, this is how Matthew summarizes it. Jesus said, repent. That means reconsider. That means turn around. That means rethink. Rethink your life. Rethink your relationship with power and how you think it works. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God has come near. It's not a thing for the afterlife. It's right here. It's right now. And it's possible for you to begin to live in it. Now, Matthew is absolutely brilliant the way it's set up. Over the course of 28 chapters, there's five distinct sections of preaching. And the first section is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's perhaps the most famous sermon that Jesus preaches. It begins in Matthew chapter 5. Could you hold up your hand like this? See, now you all know where to start when you read your Bible tonight, okay? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 begins the Sermon on the Mount. And it begins also with these eight statements, these brilliant statements called Beatitudes, or we can think of them as attitudes of the kingdom. So we've been working our way through these Beatitudes. And the first Beatitude is essentially this. It's about trusting in God's power. Jesus puts it this way. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those that recognize they need God's power. There are those that recognize that each day is a gift, that you are not promised tomorrow. You're not even promised the next moment. See, it's so easy to walk around entitled, and then you waste the joy that's available to you because you're complaining and unhappy about the moment. But the poor in spirit, they begin to live into the kingdom because they realize that this moment right now is precious. You've had precious moments, haven't you? What if you could begin to live that way all the time? This is the kingdom of God. The next one says, start with your greatest need. Now that you're beginning to trust in God's power, you're beginning to change the way you think, you're beginning to repent and rethink. Now, what are we going to start with? Well, we're going to start with the most vulnerable, most tender part of you. That is your sadness and your brokenness. Jesus puts it this way. Blessed are those who mourn or lament, who express their sorrow. If you want to know what it means to express your sorrow, go to the book of Psalms. It's an Old Testament book. There's 150 poems. 70% of them are songs of lament, psalms of lament. Blessed are those who mourn, that learn to express their sorrow, both in prayer and with one another. Those are the people that stay emotionally available. Those are the people that begin to receive comfort. And then... The third beatitude is about your power. It's starting to get good now, isn't it? Okay? We got through that hard stuff. We're going to talk about your power. Check out the way that Jesus talks about your power. Here's how he says it. Blessed are the meek or humble, for they will inherit the earth. He's talking about your power. He understands there's power in your words and your tone and your look and your touch and there's power. You got all sorts of power with your finances, how you show up. And he says, let me talk to you about your power. You are blessed when you're meek or humble. For these are the people that inherit the earth. You got to understand, okay, that meekness is not weakness. We're not talking about weakness here. Rather, what we're talking about here is power under control. You see, with the same hand, I can palm a baseball, and I can pick up a contact lens. And the difference there is power under control. And if I don't have power under control, I can break that contact lens. All right? When when I'm with my children, I can hug them, and I can squeeze them tight, and that is wonderful. But if I don't have my power under control, I can squeeze them so much it hurts. you got to have your power under control. you got power, but you need to be meek you got to learn to have it under control. Now, I want to tell you a story about somebody who has his power under control. And this is a story that happens in Matthew chapter 8, which is brilliant, okay, because this is right after the Sermon on the Mount. You think this is a coincidence? I think not. 
Even if you're not a believer, the scripture is brilliant in its literary design. And so I want to tell you this story about this man whose power is under control. It begins this way. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Now, you all know about centurions, right? Let, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion is somebody that commands 100 men. He's, a, he's an officer. And you know a centurion, you can pick him out of a crowd for two reasons. And it's up there on the screen. Any guesses? The headdress, right? That's the obvious one. The other one has to do with what's in his hand. A centurion carries a vine stick. You know what a vine stick's for? Beaten. It's for beating those hundred men. For keeping them in line. It's a form of power. It's an extension of the centurion's power. There's a Roman historian named Tacitus, he writes at the end of the first century, much of what we know about the early emperors of the first century comes from Tacitus. And Tacitus tells us the story about this one centurion named Lucilius. And Lucilius had a nickname. His nickname was, give me another. You know why he was nicknamed that? Because he kept breaking his vine stick when he was exerting his power over his men. The Romans claimed to bring peace. But beneath it was a brutal form of power. And it's this kind of man who shows up to talk to Jesus. He's the centurion in charge of the group of men that are guarding Capernaum. Capernaum is a really important place in the northern part of Israel because it's on the trade route. It's where the taxes are collected. Matthew, we talked about, or Levi a couple weeks ago, he had a tax booth in Capernaum. This guy is not only powerful with 100 men behind him carrying a vine stick, but he also is rather wealthy as well because he is running the Capernaum post. He comes up to Jesus. And here's what he says, Lord, Lord, are you kidding me? He calls Jesus Lord. Now, the centurion, he has a Lord, okay, but it ain't Jesus. You know who it is? Caesar. And Caesar doesn't think too highly of anybody that would say anybody else is in charge but himself. So this here is unbelievable that this centurion would call this Jewish rabbi from Nowheresville Lord, he goes on, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. You see what's going on here? This centurion, he's poor in spirit. He had the best medical uh, uh, available to him anywhere in the area. If anybody could get a doctor that could help, the centurion could. Yet the doctors couldn't help. He's poor in spirit, and then he laments. He expresses his sorrow. He says, he's paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. I can barely go to see him because he's suffering so bad, but when I'm there, I can barely leave because it's just horrible. And I'm coming to you for help. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And this is telling. Because in truth, the centurion didn't have to ask Jesus. He could have straight up just walked up and taken Jesus. And the Romans did that all the time. In another teaching of Jesus, he says, if somebody makes you walk one mile, walk another. It's referring to this practice in the Roman Empire where they were able to just grab any person under their control and make them carry their armor for up to a mile. He could have just grabbed Jesus. And Jesus, he's understanding that there's power here. So he asks, what the centurion says next is remarkable. The centurion replied, Lord, there he goes again, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. He's humble. He has power. Okay, the centurion has power, but his power under control. He has a degree of meekness because he has the power to get an audience with Jesus, which wasn't really all that easy because there was crowds following him everywhere. So he can come up and talk to Jesus. He uses his power, but he keeps it under control. He doesn't just grab Jesus. Now, why would he do that? What he says next reveals it. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. You see, the meek recognize they're under a higher authority. And in this case, we're not talking about Caesar. 
the centurion recognizes there's an authority even greater than Caesar. Because all the benefits of the Roman Empire aren't helping his servant and he's suffering so terribly and the centurion cares. And he recognizes there's this higher authority. I have a friend who is a really good person. But the way that he comes off with his tone puts people off. Anybody know somebody like that? And I talked to the person about it. He's a friend, care for him. And I just shared, hey, the, the, the tone often puts people off. And he was well aware of it. And I said, well, you know, don't you think you should do something about that? He said, I've always been this way. In other words, this problem that was creating tension in his relationships wasn't really his problem. It was my problem and everybody else's problem. At least that's the way he thought about it. I got a question for you. Under whose authority is my friend acting? His own. Because he's decided that he's going to go ahead and justify the way that he talks and behaves And everybody else just needs to be okay with it. And he wonders why sometimes he doesn't get invited and wonders why sometimes things don't work out. But he's unwilling to recognize that, hey, you might be the one that needs to change. The meek, on the other hand, they recognize there's a higher authority that we're all accountable to. Too, that our words have power, our tone has power, the way we look, the way we touch, it all has power. And there's a higher authority that we need to function under. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. He was amazed by the centurion's perspective that he understood that there was a higher authority, not Caesar, but this higher, higher authority, the authority over everything. He's amazed. He said, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Those were fighting words right there. You know that? Because the people, the Israelites at the time, they thought the authority and the benefits and the faith all existed within their group. But time and time again, Jesus surprised them. Surprised, right? Because there's people that you would never think of. People that you wouldn't expect to demonstrate the faith of the kingdom of God. And you all know what faith is. It's doing what you can do and then trusting God to do what only God can do. So this guy's got great faith. Jesus goes on. Many will come from the east and the west, that means outside of Israel, and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now we just learned something important about the kingdom. It's this, there's feasting in the kingdom of heaven. It's why we have a meal once a month here. To be part of the kingdom of heaven involves feasting. Now, you all know about feasting, at least I hope you do, because a couple weeks ago we celebrated as a nation, what? Thanksgiving, yeah. And and what I've learned about Thanksgiving, okay, it's one of my favorite holidays, but it's contingent on this one thing. You gotta be hungry. And this past Thanksgiving, I was sitting down eating a snack before we were going over to our family member's house for Thanksgiving. And I was like, what am I doing? I'm violating the one rule of Thanksgiving. you got to show up hungry. So important. So how do you get hungry? Okay? It's really simple. You, you engage in a little bit of starvation and then continual experimentation. A little bit of starvation. Just don't eat the day of Thanksgiving so that you show up and you just like can't wait to eat. And then, when you're there, you just try a little bit of this, try a little bit of that, have a little bit of that pie and some of that pie, right? Two kinds of turkey, I'm eating two kinds of turkey. A little white meat, dark meat. you got to experiment. you got to experiment. you got to keep trying. Keep at it. you got to be hungry. The kingdom of heaven involves hunger. The centurion, he's hungry. No doubt he tried other ways to get his servant healed. But he was poor in spirit. He recognized there's a higher authority, so he comes to Jesus. Now, the next beatitude is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for blank, for they will be fulfilled. Y'all know what it is? Righteousness. 
righteousness. You've got a hunger and thirst for righteousness. But it begs the question, whose standard of righteousness? Is it your standard? Are you the highest authority? Do people just need to figure it out and get along with you because you've always been this way? Or is there a higher standard that constantly calls us to change and grow? Whose standard of righteousness? Now, if you've been tracking with Jesus, obviously he's talking about God's standards of righteousness, which leans us back to this question, who's your king? Because we all have one. There's somebody in our lives, there's something in our lives that determines our priorities and our values and our assumptions about life. And a lot of times we just walk around without having thought about it, but we all have a king, and the invitation of Jesus is to have God, the creator, the highest authority as your king, to hunger and thirst after his righteousness. Earthly kings will leave you empty. We've been through this in the series. Earthly kings over and over, as the warning from the prophet Samuel said, they will come and they will take the best of what you got. They will give you some benefits, but earthly kings, whatever it might be, it might be king career, it might be king fear, it might be king smear or king beer, earthly kings, whatever it might be, they will take more from you than they give to you, and ultimately, you're left empty. If you're ever feeling a little empty, maybe the question for you now is, who's my king? Really? And be honest, who's my king? The heavenly king, at least what Jesus promises, is fulfillment. Fulfillment. You begin to follow those values. You begin to go on that path. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be free of suffering. That was never the promise. But there will be fulfillment. There will be peace. So, Here's what I encourage you to do. Hunger and thirst for God's kingdom. Develop an appetite for God's kingdom. You might have to engage in a little bit of starvation. You might need to turn off the phone a few hours before you go to bed. You might need to spend your Sunday afternoons differently. You might need to do that. And you probably need to engage in some more experimentation. Do you have a prayer life? Do you ever read the scripture? Are you involved in any sort of groups for educating yourself around spiritual practices? Do you serve anywhere? Do you give? But hunger and thirst, this is the way to fulfillment. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the invitation to be part of your kingdom. So help us to be poor in spirit to recognize our daily need for you because it's just simply true. Life can change in a moment. We know that. But once we know that and we begin to live that, life becomes precious. And God, help us to give our most tender parts to you. Help us to express our sorrow. And help us to control our power. For you created each and every one of us with great power in this world to either build people up or bring them down. So help us to be builders. What that takes, Lord, is hunger. So I ask, Lord, that everybody here be hungry for God's kingdom, your kingdom, your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.